Hi everyone, Lisa and Dan here from Fireside Strategic. In the Fireside chat series, we're celebrating leaders that combine humanity as well as strategy to build great organizations. Right now, we're excited to chat with Scott Kim, the CEO of Rocket Reach. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. This is great. Scott, when we have met in the past, you told me this beautiful, amazing story <laughs> of how you came to be where you are. I was wondering if you could just start out and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and when I tell my story, I, I typically start at the beginning. Um, and so I, you know, I, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, um, the, uh, the son of two immigrants um, from Korea. And, uh, you know, spent most of my life uh, working at my mom's store, uh, which has been an interesting, has kind of had an interesting impact on, uh, on my own life and my career, I think. Uh, so my parents owned a African-American beauty supply store. And so every day after school, I, you know, went to the store to help, you know, to help operate the store a little bit. Um, and then all day Saturday, I would spend usually doing stock most days. Um, and so I spent many, many years kind of working uh, the aisles and the cash register at the store. And one of the things that was kind of super impactful to my life there was that I was, you know, I was selling products that I never used, right? So I sold tons of products, uh, including, you know, nail, you know, uh, 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 paint for your nails, hair weaves, wigs, kind of everything in the store. And, you know, when you're selling uh, products like that to someone, they, they're going to ask me, like, so what do you think is better? And I had to constantly learn from other customers what the right answers to those questions were. And so I think I learned a lot about how to read body language and how someone's kind of accepting, uh, you know, um, a, a sales pitch. And I think that's affected a lot of the way I communicate now. So I spent, you know, all, you know, from year zero to 18 uh, in St. Louis working at my mom's store, and I ended up going to Stanford, um, and I went in uh, pre-med. And so, you know, I think many other immigrant children <laughs> go in pre-med, and I was a good, you know, kind of a good son. Uh, but af quickly after uh, attending uh, or starting school, I realized that pre-med just wasn't for me. And um, I'd taken a couple of computer science classes, both in high school um, and in college. And I realized very quickly that I really liked to build things uh, with computers. <laughs> and so I uh, graduated um, from college with a, a computer science degree. And of course, being in the Bay Area, you end up going to work at a startup. <laughs> and uh, so I went to go work at the, uh, before Andreessen Horowitz was, a, was uh, a venture capital firm, they started a company back then called LoudCloud. Um, I was super excited to, uh, to join that company. It was kind of the last company to go public in, in the dot-com bubble, <laughs> I think. And uh, it was a super fun ride there. Um, I, think when I, I think when I got my offer at the company to, you know, like, I was like employee number 200. And by the time I started, because I got the offer, let's say like April. And then by the time I started in June after, after we graduated, there were like a thousand employees in the company. It was an insane, insane uh, kind of roller coaster there. Um, so I uh, went to go work there as a software engineer uh, for, for a couple of years uh, and then uh, ended up uh, leaving that company and working at a company called Ask Jeeves back before uh, Google was Google. <laughs> and we were working on search engine technology and natural language processing and a lot of, you know, quite honestly, a lot of machine learning um, and uh, techniques that are really widely used today. But back then uh, were used primarily uh, in search kind of early on in their, in their uh, in the infancy and at least in kind of consumer applications. Um, and had tons of roles there uh, in technology. So I was a software engineer. I, you know, ran QA. I back. I ran a data center back when we had data centers <laughs> before AWS existed. Um, got to do kind of everything in technology. And during that time, uh, we also got acquired by IAC. Um, and at IAC, you know, that 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 at that point, uh, the conglomerate owned uh, companies like LendingTree and Match.com and Expedia, just a whole bunch of different companies together. And, um, you know, at some point I reached the CTO role at Ask and really realized that I wanted to apply the knowledge I had about technology and apply it to businesses kind of at large. And um, I got the opportunity um, to GM a couple of businesses there. Um, and of course, when you work at a search engine, the first type of business you want to start is a business based on SEO. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I got to, you know, uh, got the opportunity to GM a couple of businesses. Um, we were able to grow those businesses really quickly and um, pretty, uh, pretty successfully. 
And then uh, started to look at acquisitions um, that we were doing as a company, both within Ask and kind of within IAC uh, uh, as, a, as a larger company. And one of the companies, uh, one of the last companies I looked at uh, was a company called About.com. And the New York Times was selling About.com. They'd acquired it three or four years earlier. And uh, so I actually got, uh, I got shipped out to, to, that's how I ended up in New York. I got shipped out on what was supposed to be a three month a three month excursion <laughs> to be interim CEO of about.com. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I landed, I was trying to help assess what was needed to help, you know, get the business back into growth. It, it had declined over the last couple of years and, you know, involved a lot of SEO and it involved a lot of monetization and other things. And um, so uh, I was there for three months, hired a great, great CEO uh, named Neil Vogel uh, to be CEO of the business. And I was kind of like, okay, I'm kind of, you know, I'm done. We're going to, I'm going to go back to the Bay area now where it's, you know, not as cold in the winters. <laughs> and he was like, no, 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 you're, you're not allowed to leave yet. <laughs> um, so he asked me to stay on as COO. And um, I learned just a tremendous amount uh, from him about what it takes to take a business that, you know, was once successful, had gone through some decline and needed to come back uh, into growth. And it was really foundational in a lot of ways on many aspects of the business from kind of the model uh, that they produce content um, and the model they use to, uh, to, add, to, to monetize that content and um, how you think about an organization and technology. And it's kind of it involved every facet of the business had to be kind of turned over and looked at and kind of reanalyzed to reconstruct uh, in a different way. And so uh, it's kind of a, a basic turnaround. Um, and I, I'm happy to say that a lot of the foundational work we put back in there now has become uh, now called Dot Dash, which is a very successful uh, content producer. Um, and Neil's still the CEO, he's doing a tremendous job over there. And so uh, as I was kind of exiting uh, that role, I got recruited to go uh, be CEO of bankrate.com. And they kind of needed the same, uh, same, same kind of uh, architecture put into their business to take a declining business back into growth. And so I uh, got to focus again on product and SEO and the team and the culture and a lot of facets of that business. And then ultimately also a uh, kind of fundamental business model change that was needed there. Um, we moved the business from kind of a flat pricing model over to a variable uh, model. And that really helped solve that business. And we, and we grew it um, immensely. We got, actually got, I think we got it to, it, it's a really old business. It's been around for like 40 years, which is crazy because it used to be a newspaper business. <laughs> and uh, we got it to like record revenues and profits, which is, which is awesome. And, uh, and at, at the end of that, my time in that business, we were actually selling that business. So that business got sold with, uh, as one part of a larger publicly traded business uh, called Bank Great Incorporated. Um, and so we sold that business off, uh, and then I went to go look for my next challenge. I actually took a little bit of time off in between there. I, uh, my parents, so my parents, back into the immigrant story, my parents uh, are hilarious, um, and they're awesome. And one of the things they did uh, was they literally came to the U.S. to get me and my sister educated. <laughs> and I think, like, literally maybe two to three years after we graduated from college, uh, they moved back to Korea. <laughs> so <laughs> they were here for, like, you know, they got here in, like, 1970. After one year, my sister was born and a couple of years after that, I was born. And then they stayed here for like, you know, 20 some odd years. And then they moved back to Korea right after we graduated from college, I think, because their like job was done. Um, so I got to spend uh, that summer um, after after we, I finished the bank rate uh, in Korea with my parents. And I got to take my kids there for the first time. Um, and it was really, really great to see, to, to be able to allow them to spend, you know, months and months with their grandparents and then experience the Korean culture and learn a little bit of language as well. Um, obviously when kids are young, they can pick up the language unbelievably fast, uh, which is awesome. And then I uh, came back, uh, came back uh, from kind of a, a nice summer in Korea and um, went to go work at ZocDoc. Um, ZocDoc is a marketplace uh, for where doctors and patients uh, can meet. And you can do, you know, online uh, scheduling uh, for for appointments, and now you can even do uh, you can schedule for uh, vaccinations and things uh, related to COVID, which is uh, which is awesome. And uh, they actually needed almost this identical business model change uh, that um, that Bankrate went through, going from a variable, in their case, a subscription model, uh, from a static uh, subscription model over to a variable model. And it took about two years to get that in place, uh, primarily due to the um, due to the regulatory landscape. And so, um, 
uh, it just took about almost two years uh, to get the entire model in place. And I'm happy to say that the business, you know, is m uh, much better footing now uh, than it was during in the in the subscription business. And uh, I actually got the profitability for the first time in its entire history as well, uh, due to the switch uh, of the model. And then that lands me where I am now. Uh, I'm at Rocket Reach, uh, which is a slightly different kind of twist, you know, in the in the about.com and bank rate, uh, bank rate situation is definitely, you know, more of a, what I would call a traditional turnaround scenario uh, where the business was declining and you have to kind of bend the U to bring it back to growth. Um, in uh, with, with Rocket Reach, it's, it's different. It's a business that's, been, you know, been growing um, uh, very quickly over the last, since its inception about four years ago um, with his two founders who are uh, really have been great, great, great uh, operators uh, and, um, and uh, engineers and product people in the business. And so this is actually the, like the fun part of a turnaround. So the turnaround, you, the, the hard part is really when you're trying to bend the U back around, you're like trying to, you know, rebuild the team and other things. Uh, Rocket Reach is not that. The team is uh, really great. Um, and we get to do the fun part, which is like really growing the business <laughs> together. Uh, and so, uh, so that kind of lands me to today. Well, so much richness to unpack there and <laughs> some really, really cool business conversations. I know we, we can have, but even just at a personal level, I almost want to start with, I think mean, one, one of the really cool things that stands out for me about your story is how, you know, you, you go to the Bay area and you have conversations about startups and people are saying, oh, we need a technical co-founder and a non-technical co-founder. But what's cool is, you know, you go to Stanford, you realize pre-med's not your thing, but hmm, computers look really cool. But you're also bringing that background of being really sensitive and empathetic to people, right? Being in that convenience store setting, knowing nothing about the products you're selling, you got to build empathy and connection with people really quickly. So, you know, that classic sort of barrier dichotomy of, are you a technical co-founder or <laughs> non-technical co-founder? Well, you know, you can lead a business from both angles, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, it really just comes down to the product, right? Like whether I'm selling a product or we're building a product, um, it's all about how the customers, you know, they, they need to want that product. <laughs> and uh, I think that's really the bridge I try to play in a lot of the, in a lot of the roles and a lot of the businesses I, I, um, I get involved in and I get to, I get lucky enough to work on is that um, when you, you know, have a firm belief that when you really build a strong product and then treat your customers right, <laughs> uh, that's kind of where the magic happens. And, um, and then you can you use that as your fundamentals uh, and infrastructure within your business. Then you can build the rest of the business kind of around that, around that piece. That makes a lot of sense. And you, know, you mentioned in the beginning of your story that you had to, from a very young age, learn customer research, not exactly the typical topic <laughs> in your you know, third grade class. And what I find very striking is that you seem to take that customer centric lens to everything you do, even as you make operational improvements, even as if you, when you change pricing models, it seems like your philosophy really is still honed in around that customer research and understanding where people are coming from. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think about it in two kind of buckets, really, you know, really high level. One is absolutely kind of data driven, right? You need lots and lots and lots of data to understand um, kind of how your product is working with customers and what they like and what they don't like about it in, as you can read it out of the data. And, um, you know, one of the things I like to really uh, uh, create within as part of the culture of a business um, when I join is a real deep, uh, real deep um, uh, investment in the data itself. Right, and making sure that we have a great data warehouse, we have um, analysts, and we have product people and technologists and business people who are very, very, very data driven. So super, super important, um, and I think it's become more and more important over the last decade or so, and will only become more important beyond that as can businesses continue to evolve. Because I think that the ones have, that have the best data often will be able to make the best choices the fastest. And, uh, you know, it's interesting I, that the number of hours, you know, back, back in my mom's store, it was, you know, how many hours was I spending at the store, you know, after school and on Saturday. And that was how we were, I was collecting data. Now we get to do it with like computers and machines and pixels and a whole bunch of other things, which makes the job way, way easier. Um, and then the other side is the qualitative aspect of, of, um, of getting feedback, right? 
you have to have that other side um, and understand how uh, customers want to talk about your product. How are they perceiving your product? You know, why would they not purchase your product? Um, uh, and why they and why they do purchase your product? You have to kind of uh, have both sides of that equation in order to have a more complete picture of how to define your product roadmap and define your business strategy, and um, and where to take the business long term. I love it. It's such a holistic view of how a customer thinks, but also how a business functions and how an economy functions, combining the quantitative <laughs> and the qualitative. That's the way that these amazing decisions are made. Something that um, I'm very curious about, just based on your story, it seems that you have this history other than your current you know, position of coming into a, a company when it's in trouble, when it's struggling <laughs> and doing a turnaround. I can now see why a company would want to hire somebody like you to do that because <laughs> you're quite brilliant and awesome. But I would love to understand why do you think that you have had this history of coming into struggling companies? What is it about these companies that are moving down that pulls you in and then allows you to turn them around? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the nice word. That's you know, way too nice to, uh, to talk about someone like me. But um, <laughs> But you know, I think it's at its fundamental level for me, and this is why I got involved in computer science originally. Is I like to build and fix, and you know, a turnaround is definitely a fix scenario. But then you look at a company like Rocket Reach, which doesn't need to be fixed, it but it was in need of some change to go beyond the business today to be you know really the business that it that it that it can be. So it for me, I think about it as a business that's in, that's in need of some change. Um, it just happened to be that some of the, some of the change that was needed was related to companies that were, you know, on the on the downturn and needed to be turned around on the upturn. But at the end of the day, it's still conceptually, I feel like the same thing. And I think it's just part of my personality at the end of the day. Um, I like to build and fix and uh, understand how things work and then make improvements to them. Um, yeah, just yesterday, I have, a, I have an eight year old son. Um, he's in third grade right now. And uh, the, the, the thing he wanted more than anything else for Christmas last year uh, was like one of those kids 3D printers. And so we got him one uh, as like his, you know, his like his really big present for uh, Christmas. He had, you know, he's, he's a really great kid. He deserves <laughs> something nice. Uh, and uh, just yesterday it broke. Right. So, of course. And um, the, the way it works is like, you know, it's, it's probably too inside baseball, but the, you know, there's like a little feeder that brings in the plastic that gets melted and then gets printed on uh, by the by the needle. And the thing that broke is basically that the spindle on the back got stuck and it couldn't turn. So the plastic couldn't get fed in. Um, and my son was like, hey, my printer's broken. I was like, and he was kind of like, can I have some help? And I like jumped out of my chair. I was like, yep, I'll help you. Because <laughs> I, I think I actually fundamentally enjoy uh, kind of debugging and figuring out what's wrong. And then I take, a, and I do take a lot of sat satisfaction when you can, after you fix it, you're like, oh, I fixed it. That's, that's pretty cool. It works now. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that's kind of just part of my personality and why I do what I do. And I, I I think it's very good to be self-aware, you know, when you lead a business like that, because leaders bring so many different traits to the table. And so some people are not so suited to the tinkering. Some people are not so suited to that. Some people are more suited to like building from scratch. I think it's a very different personality type that makes sense to lead a, a business, right? Um, and so has that always been, have you always had a sense that Hmm, these are some personality traits I bring to the table and they make sense in these sort of tinkering, reforming kind of situations? Yeah, I think that's been kind of a, quite honestly, been a little bit of a later recognition for me. I think, you know, um, when I graduated from college, I was like, okay, at some point I'm definitely going to start a company. Like that was like a for yeah. sure thing in my head. Yeah. And, you know, through the opportunities I was, I was given and the opportunities that I was lucky enough to have, I really realized that that like, that like zero to one phase I'm actually not that good at that. <laughs> like, I'm just not, my brain is not built for that um, as much as the like, okay, we have this thing right here and we can improve it greatly from where it is today. And yeah. you have to kind of go in and figure out what's wrong with it and understand the landscape and the competitive dynamics and all these other things to be able to do that. But I'm much better at that phase. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, I think that my, in my heart of hearts, I would have said, you know, when I was 22 years old, graduating yeah. college, I would go, oh, yeah, for sure, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, but I think I'm actually a bit different than that. And that's that's an, been an important recognition, though, you're right, uh, for, for even the opportunities I take a look at and, um, and want to get involved in. 
Yeah. And I think that's very powerful self-awareness because there's something about the mythology of the entrepreneur that's extremely compelling. And most people, you know, they want to lead a business. They think to themselves, well, it makes sense to start it from scratch. And it's hard given that mythology for people to recognize the sacrifices involved in going from zero to one. Now, having done it a few times, someone should probably stop me from doing it again because <laughs> it's a lot of work, right? And yeah, uh, I think it is a lot more fun once once things are, the sort of solid foundation is in place and then it's a matter of tinkering. And so sometimes, I mean, entrepreneurship is awesome. I always encourage people to give it a shot, but the mythology of the entrepreneur has so much to do with starting a business from scratch as opposed to leading a business once that foundation's in place. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I look at some of these businesses uh, that have gone through like, you know, the pivot or like a massive pivot and then have become, you know, wildly successful. I think Slack is, I think, I think an example of this where you know, it started off with a totally different product, but then they realized the thing they had built for their team was actually the thing. <laughs> that's actually the yes. thing. Yes. And I think that's where mm -hmm. my brain can't operate as well on like a wholesale pivot to a business from like doing one thing and like really going deep on that and then doing something entirely different. Um, so I think that's one of the, the harder parts. And I think that's what entrepreneurs are, you know, are really great at is saying, like, you know what, I'm going to throw all that away. We're going to start over and go in this totally different direction and have as much energy and, and focus and, um, and a little bit of, you know, an optimism as well <laughs> about why that's the right direction and go 110% at that. I think that's an amazing trait when I see it uh, in, in other leaders of the organizations that have done that massive pivot. Um, cool, I, I agree. And as we come towards the end of our time together, Scott, really curious just to learn a little bit more about Rocket Reach and, and sort of the next steps, the goals, you know, we're, we're I want to say on the cusp of the new year, we're about a couple of months in, but what are the plans for, for 2021 and, and going forward for Rocket Reach? Yeah, so Rocket Reach, uh, pretty simply put, is the fastest way for someone to find contact info about someone they're trying to reach. Um, you know, the, the largest verticals that we serve right now are, uh, not surprisingly, sales, number one. <laughs> uh, second is marketing, because generally you're marketing to people. Um, and then third is recruiting as well. Um, and uh, so... The plans for this year are pretty simple. Uh, we are going to continue our growth uh, in the business that's been going on uh, for the past uh, since since inception, which has been a torrid growth pace. Um, and then the second the second thing that we're really focused on is hiring. Um, mm. You know, it is it is a competitive environment out there <laughs> uh, for lots of different types of roles. And um, you know, I think hiring for us is probably our number one priority. Uh, we have literally uh, you know everyone a lot of companies have this but you have literally a mile long list of things that are huge opportunities all priority number one like we have that problem where we have so much low-hanging fruit in front of us and uh you know at some level uh you have to have enough people to go after all the low-hanging fruit you want to um so we're doing you know we have to do kind of massive sequencing and prioritization because um uh we need more people in our business um and then, uh, well, I'll, I'll obviously also uh, really, really work on uh, what I call the quality of our product, right? Like at the end of the day, if we're effectively um, giving people data, um, that data has to be of you know the utmost quality or else it's ineffective for what they're trying to use. And then the way in which our customers, kind of back to what we talked about before, the way in which our customers interact with our data and get access to our data through search and through filters and things like that, um, is another huge part of our product roadmap uh, this year. So um, a lot of work on the product side, but then we will hire across almost every function uh, in the business because we really just have um, sales, marketing, uh, you know, recruiters to hire the people. Like, like the whole thing needs to kind of grow in order for us to kind of get the fruit that we know we can uh, we can harvest. That's a very dynamic plan. I love it. Something that I'm very curious about is you have your you have all these analytical frameworks and all these goals from the customer side, from the product side, from the hiring side. I'm curious, as far as you go as the CEO, as the leader, what are some of your leadership goals, some of the human goals that you're trying to accomplish in the coming year? Yeah, you know, that's super interesting. I think, uh, yeah, we just had a board meeting uh, not too long ago. And the number one risk I put on, you know, for 2021 in our planning was not hiring fast enough, right? As I mentioned, like we just need lots of people. And then the number two risk uh, was hiring too fast, right? <laughs> so the, you know, 
we're trying to be very uh, prescriptive and, um, and do a good job at being able to scale our organization in a way uh, that can be successful. Um, I've, you know, I've talked to lots of people like, oh, we just hired too fast and it just kind of got unwieldy and got, <laughs> got out of control. It's definitely something that we're very concerned about given the number of people who wanna hire this year. And so in order to do that successfully, I think there's a, a lot of things that have to happen, um, both from like an employee experience perspective, right? How do they get onboarded? Um, how do they start? Who's their buddy for their onboarding? All those pieces, the tactical pieces that happen that really make an employee experience for, uh, great. And then really setting, uh, setting our cultural values. Um, I think if you ask everyone in, in Rocket Reach today, what are our cultural values? You kind of get a mixed set of answers, but they'd probably be mostly, uh, mostly the same around data and velocity and, um, and working together. Uh, but you know, I, I think one of the things we uh, have to do a lot of work on is really codifying our cultural values so that we have a, a North Star that everyone's pointed at uh, with respect to how we wanna build this organization culturally and um, what's important to us uh, that, that, you know, I think really starts in th those things are super important. And even in the recruiting phase, right. Having something to point and say, like, this is what, this is what we are culturally. And if you like these things, this is the bus that, you know, this is, this is what it means to get on our bus. Um, that's, that's a huge, a uh, huge focus for us this year. That's not easy. You know, it's so, <laughs> yeah. I feel like sometimes things like values, um, they feel a little mushy. They feel a little squishy. People aren't really sure what they're for, but I think you're absolutely spot on that defining them and making sure that they're authentic is what builds a fantastic organization. And I love that you're so self-aware about implementing the right values to create a smart growth trajectory. Very cool. Yeah. Well, look, Scott, as we actually come to the end of the interview, <laughs> so you're too entertaining. We can't stop. <laughs> um, one question that we love to wrap up with is when you're not working, building amazing companies, turning them around with your working on rocket reach, um, what do you like to do for fun? What do you do to entertain yourself? Yeah, so I have two kids, as I mentioned. I have an eight-year-old uh, son and a uh, daughter who's five, who's in preschool. And uh, quite honestly, if I'm if I'm not working, I'm hanging out with my kids. <laughs> um, and look, they're you know, kids these days are crazy busy. <laughs> the number of activities they have and other things is is really high. And so um, I'm trying to you know take as much part as I can in those activities with them. Um, and so it, between work and and family, I probably don't have that much time outside of that, unfortunately. Um, but that's what I like to spend my time on. Um, you know, work and family are, are, you know, number one, number one priorities in my life. And so that, that takes up 99% of the time that I have. Well, luckily, part of that includes fixing 3D printers. So I think <laughs> the love of tinkering and solving problems <laughs> seems to transcend everything. <laughs> Well, look, Scott, thank you so much for taking the time today to share your story. It's so inspiring and your energy and kind of your lighthearted approach really comes through. I think something that struck me throughout this conversation is the, like, your vibe is so positive and so energetic and the way that you view these problems, it's, you could tell that you enjoy it. And yeah. It's really inspiring. It's really cool. <laughs> thank so thank you so well, thank much. Thank you for, for having me. Today. No, thank you for having me. This has been great. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation today. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing this live as well. <laughs>